Hello, everyone. This is Dave Farnsworth. Uh, welcome to Federal Dollars, State Policies, and Heat Pumps, the Future of Heat in the Midwest. This is a first uh, in a series of RAP webinars that are going to be looking at regional efforts to decarbonize the building sector through heat pump adoption. As the title suggests, today we're talking about the Midwest, and we've assembled a terrific lineup of speakers to help us understand the many issues and the opportunities in that part of the U.S. We have Kellen McSweeney, Senior Program Manager at Slipstream, a firm that works to transform the built environment in beneficial ways to address the extraordinary impacts of climate change. Slipstream supports the Midwest Heat Pump Collaborative, and Kellen's responsible for business initiatives, program management, project operations that support Slipstream's mission and program work. We have Robbie Vandergon, Air Source Heat Pump Initiative Manager at the Center for Energy and Environment. Robbie oversees the Air Source Heat Pump Initiative within the Minnesota Efficient Technology Accelerator. This collaborative is part of the accelerator's broader market transformation program that seeks alternative pathways to support emerging products beyond the traditional utility rebate programs. And we have Andrew McNeely, who is the manager of energy solutions at Upper Peninsula Power Company, known as UPCO, an investor-owned utility in Marquette, Michigan. Andrew's portfolio includes energy efficiency programs, energy assistance, that's working with nonprofits and community-based energy assistance programs to help customers pay their bills, and beneficial electrification. Today's discussion is going to be moderated by Vivian Cox from CLASP and Rafi Bright from RAP. A couple quick administrative points. This webinar is going to run about 60 minutes, but at the top of the hour, if folks are still on, we will run an additional 30 minutes and answer questions. There are a lot of you, so we're going to keep you muted. We will be, uh, be recording this, so folks who can't be here today will still be able to uh, enjoy this. And in a few days, we'll send you a link to the recording. For questions, please use the, you guessed it, questions function, not the chat function. If you use the chat function, we'll still retrieve your question. But uh, Try to use the question function. Anyway, I hope you enjoy this, everyone. And uh, with that, Rafi, uh, the microphone's yours. Thanks a lot, Dave. Um, and welcome, everybody, to this webinar. Uh, and Kellen, thank you for uh, coming and joining us today. Uh, I'm going to start the conversation by just asking you, Kellen, to tell us a little bit about yourself, a little bit about Slipstream and the Midwest Heat Pump Collaborative. Sure. So Kellen McSweeney, I'm happy to be here today. So thanks everyone for joining. Um, we have a really good picture between myself, Andrew, and Robbie. We work together on a lot of things. We work separately on a lot of things. So hopefully we have a lot of good information um, for you all today. But as, as David and Rafi mentioned, I work for uh, an organization called Slipstream. We are a mission-based nonprofit and, and we're really working on accelerating climate solutions. And a lot of that has to do with heat pumps, which is what we're gonna talk about for most of today. Um, and Slipstream is a part of a team um, that works on the Midwest Air Source Heat Pump Collaborative. Um, I can get into the details of that right now, Rafi, or if you wanna jump into specific questions, either way. Um, let, let's dive right in, and, and as uh, as needed, I can kind of prompt you, or, or we can dive deeper. But um, floor is yours to set the set the table. Sure, um, I'll give a brief just background on the Midwest Air Source Heat Pump Collaborative for for anyone who's not familiar. So this group was formed in 2022 with funding from the Department of Energy through the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. And the focus is really to accelerate, <clears throat> pardon me, I'm getting over a little bit of a cold, um, but accelerating air source heat pump adoption across the Midwest. So our partner team is, is Slipstream, um, who I am with, uh, CEE, who, who Robbie works for, um, and you'll be hearing from him. And we work with some other really great folks from CEE on, that, on this program, as well as Mia and Elevate. And so through this collaborative, our primary goal has been to cross-pollinate as a region, um, share best practices uh, across states um, in order to advance this air service heat pump technology. And I'm, I'm laughing a little bit because right before this, we were just talking about what is actually defined as Midwest states. There could probably be arguments about that. We're gonna use Mia's definition of the 13 Midwest states when I'm talking about the Midwest, but 
Um, yeah, I know we could probably have some conversation there, but through the collaborative, our focus over these past few years, so since 2022, um, I mean, as we know, heat pumps are a really diverse, large um, technology group. So the Midwest Heat Pump Collaborative has really been uh, focusing in on residential heat pumps. Um, we've done a lot in the past few years, including uh, a needs assessment. It was really how we kicked things off in 2022 and did some regional market transformation strategy. Um, we've held a lot of webinars and done some white papers. I'll probably reference those later um, on topics like equitable workforce development and um, electric rates and rate structure. Um, we've also done some conference workshops within the region and um, a lot of, or a handful of free contractor training summits, which has really been like boots on the ground training for contractors in probably at least four states in the Midwest footprint. So that's just a little bit of background on the Midwest Air Source Heat Collaborative and what we're up to. And um, yeah, I'll definitely, we'll be sure to share out links to the website and anything else that I reference as well. <laughs> Great, thanks for that. Um, can you can you dive into a little bit more on the on the the needs assessment? Uh, what what did that entail, and um, how's that? How you put that to use? Yeah, of course. So as you could probably guess from the term needs assessment, the the main purpose was to um, really shed light on the state of the Midwest and identify what those key opportunities for market transformation are. Um, and since it started at the very beginning of the Midwest uh, Air Source Heat Pump Collaborative being formed, it helped guide what our focus was for the for the following years as well. So that needs assessment incorporated data analysis uh, and also insights gained from extensive stakeholder interviews. So that include included utilities, states, government entities, manufacturers, distributors, all the market act actors, and we have this really. Uh, uh, well, two resources that I'll, that I'll point to is we have this really handy dashboard on the website. It's a Tableau dashboard that has various um, data dashboards showing things like housing stocks across the Midwest, average electric rates, weather data, you know, favorable policies, stuff like that. So um, that came out of the needs assessment and the data analysis. Um, and then I mentioned those interviews where um, we have a lot of unique uh, perspectives from folks like utilities, state governments and energy offices, um, the, the different state collaboratives as well. Um, and unsurprisingly, we have a webinar that dives into all of the, the like deeper details of things that came out of that needs assessment. So I won't get too much into the into those details, but some probably some of our most common insights from that needs assessment and how it sort of positioned us and gave us direction for what we're doing now. Um, across all market actors that, that we spoke to, there's a big desire, unsurprisingly, for simplicity and cohesion across the region in terms of program designs and um, even things like incentives. And folks are always wanting things to be more simple as it comes, as it, as it comes to what's going on with heat pumps across states. Um, there was also um, everyone pretty much noted the need for more contractor and customer education to overcome the barriers we have to adoption across the board. I think everyone agrees. Even now, two years later, we, we need more education. Um, and then another big one was probably the importance of building up a workforce to support the shift um, to more heat pump technology. So building up that contractor workforce and that has sort of guided um, how we how we've been doing these free contractor training summits to to help start to train the folks that are that are in the field. So maybe that's the the highlights of the needs assessment and um, what we looked at and sort of how it impacted where we're going now with the with the collaborative. Thank you. Um, and the needs assessment is that done kind of state by state. Uh, were, were there did you come out of this and say, well, this here's the state, there's the here's the status for this state here, here's the status for this state over here? Yeah. I would say so the data dashboard that I that I mentioned has state specific uh data analysis. Uh the insights that we received from market actors, I mean, there's definitely some unique perspectives from let's say a, a utility in, in Michigan versus a utility in Iowa, um, but a lot of the high level insights from the interviews 
um, were grouped more by market actor type um, and not by state. So across the board, utilities generally had some of the the same perspectives and manufacturers generally had some of the same perspectives that was less stratified um, across, you know, between states. Were there any takeaways that were, you know, particularly interesting or surprising to you uh, from, from any of those different actors? It's, it's, that's a good question because now this needs assessment was done a few years ago. And so I feel like the, 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 the most important topics are all we talk about now. So like, no, we've always known that we need better workforce development um, or, you know, more support for electric rates. Um, so nothing is coming is coming to the top of mind right now. Um, but I think just the agreement between some of the different market actors was what was surprising to me. You know, you of course we got unique perspectives between let's say a distributor versus a utility. Um, but overall there was a lot more similarities than differences, um, which surprised me. Yeah, well that's, I, I, I'm gonna say I'm a little surprised as well, kind of kind of heartened if we're all in the, on the same page at least about what, what we need, where we'd like to go, um, that, that might streamline things, hopefully streamline things a, a little bit. Um, we only have a couple minutes left, so I wanted to, you, you mentioned earlier, um, there was also a report on, on rate design. Could you talk about that a little bit as a, as a policy tool? Definitely, and I think I've said this four times, we have a deep dive, a white paper and a webinar on rate design. In two minutes, I'm not going to be able to get into the complexity of rates. Um, we're also lucky to have Robbie on the call, and I think um, Robbie might talk about this a little bit later, but ultimately the white paper that we put out argues um, that the region's utility, you know, really need to adopt a lower rate for heat pumps so that customer costs um, aren't going to increase and, and punish those air source heat pump users and those adopters. Um, it's much, much more complex than that, but we do have some good examples of folks who are who are doing this and seeing some positive, positive impacts. And Andrew, you might have some thoughts on this later too, but Excel Minnesota um, recently proposed a special electric space heating rate. Um, I know Great Lakes in Michigan has a, a discount for heat pump space heating in, in some months. And I think even Mid-American in Iowa is a pretty good example of a state that has a declining um, block rate in their standard residential service rate. Um, so I know I only have a, a minute. So rates are really complex, but there are some states that are starting to to make some movement um, in terms of in terms of rate design. Yeah, thanks for that, and sorry for for putting you on the spot for the ninety seconds. No, seconds that's on, totally uh, okay. rate design. Uh, There's rate a lot design. to say on rate design. Yeah, that's uh, well, a really interesting topic. So I did want to make sure we touched on it a little bit, um, and and you teed up uh, that that Robbie maybe can speak a little more to this, which is great because that's a perfect segue to the second um, part of our conversation. I'm going to hand this off now to my colleague Vivian and Robbie for the second short interview. Thanks, Rafi and Kellen, for kicking us off. So um, I wanted to start uh, our conversation with Robbie Vandergon from uh, the Minnesota CEE uh, Center for Energy Environment by asking if you could share a little bit more about the um, Air Source Heat Pump Initiative um, and CEE and some of the, the mission and objectives for, for you guys. Uh, sure, yeah, thank you. Happy to, to share. So CEE broadly is a nonprofit. We're focused on deploying uh, solutions that can save energy and also help the economy. And um, heat pumps are a great nexus there. Uh, we work broadly within the efficient technology framework, which is uh, something that was formed out of a statute that was passed in uh, 2021. And uh, I'm just pasting that link if anyone wants to dive into the details. Uh, but basically, we're operated within a market transformation program. So uh, broadly thinking uh, within the framework, NIA really defines this very well. They call it the, the strategic process of uh, intervening in a market to create lasting change in market behavior by removing identified barriers or exploiting opportunities to accelerate the adoption of all cost-effective energy efficiency 
as a matter of standard practice. So we're really launching this effort with a few different initiatives and uh, heat pumps are one of those. And we're lucky that we can operate under an existing brand called the Minnesota Air Source Heat Pump Collaborative, which was launched in 2019 before the Efficient Technology Accelerator launched. And now that we're in this robust framework, uh, we've been um, going through a series of well-defined processes. And one of those uh, was uh, doing a market characterization as well as creating a market transformation plan. And uh, so we have uh, identified very similar barriers that Kellen was just mentioning. Uh, there's an undefined or weak value proposition uh, for customers, contractors, distributors, and manufacturers for heat pumps. Uh, there's a potential for higher operational costs uh, because of that spark spread or the difference between heating fuel uh, costs on a, a per unit basis. Rates play into it, as Kellen mentioned, and the efficiency of the equipment. There's also that lack of experience, Kellen mentioned, both on the customer and contractor side. And then these inconsistent incentive designs is also another barrier that we're encountering. I think many folks are aware of uh, the tax credit and the IRA programs having different uh, incentives. And then we have a whole myriad in Minnesota alone. We have over 170 different utility programs that all have different specifications. So we're trying to work through uh, a lot of different requirements to uh, create alignments so that it's a little easier for customers and contractors. Um, yeah, and I guess through the collaborative, we're, we're really focused on uh, taking action against these barriers to help resolve those. And our primary focus areas are on contractor engagement and education. So we have launched a uh, um, a preferred contractor network that helps customers find contractors. And there's a betting process that we uh, have developed for that network that will uh, ensure the contractor has gone through a required training course, uh, making sure to hit home uh, some key concepts um, to ensure that both the customer is satisfied and that we're having good quality installations. And um, uh, we, we travel around to meet the contractors where they're at. Uh, we also offer a cost of heat comparison tool uh, that allows contractors to educate customers when they're selling the product when a certain product might have a more advantageous um, operating costs. For example, dual fuel is typically the, the way to go or using a, a hybrid or dual fuel rate and then also uh, creating guides. And then we're just getting into the customer education piece. We conducted some research that will be published soon on our website uh, that really hones in on what customers really want to know uh, with the system. Um, and the spoiler alert is kind of just affirming what many of us might suspect, that it's really upfront cost and operating cost are the really most important things, even among segments that identify themselves as eco-conscious. It's still occurring uh, for those folks. So. Um, the, just the carbon savings alone is not necessarily the way uh, we can uh, drive change. And if folks are curious, I'm pasting a link to where you can find all of our research around the market characterization, market transformation plan, and this customer research that will be published there uh, soon as well. What a great summary, and thank you for sharing those resources, Robbie. Uh, that's excellent. Um, so you talked a little bit about some of the the barriers uh, to, to that you guys have seen. Could you talk a little bit more about some of the the most significant challenges that you see facing the adoption of heat pumps in Minnesota? Uh, definitely, yeah. I think um, I think some of the the barriers just to unpack those a little bit more. Um, gas costs did go up a bit. Um, over the past few years, but uh, looking at the trends now, they've come back down. And so uh, rate design is really a key uh, component that I think is needed to be able to uh, promote that lower operating cost for heat pumps. And uh, in Minnesota, we do have some existing rate structures that uh, are helpful at that. Um, for example, uh, consumer-owned utilities, so these might be um, uh, cooperatives. Uh, many of them in the state offer a, uh, a dual fuel or off-peak rate, 
And those use a subtractive meter that's often subsidized by the utility, or it's just a lower cost. Um, however, there is a challenge with those systems that many of the variable speed products are incompatible uh, with those. So uh, we're trying to work at creating a qualified products list that will uh, be compatible with those systems and working with uh, some of the utilities to verify that those can actually operate as expected. And then those customers know, customers and contractors would know uh, what systems that they can put on uh, to these lower cost rates. And then also, uh, uh, Kellen and Rafi mentioned the Excel rate that uh, we're also uh, looking forward to seeing where that develops. I think um, with investor-owned utilities, typically there's a, a barrier if they do have an existing dual fuel rate that it requires an entirely separate meter. And this is covered in that uh, paper Kellen mentioned. Uh, when there's a separate meter cost there, um, that can cost as much as $2,000. That's really cost prohibitive. So uh, rolling out a different rate that um, is supportive of, uh, of a heat pump's actual cost uh, to serve the customer is, is what's needed there. And Excel Energy has proposed uh, a new rate within their uh, time of use rate. And we've provided comments uh, in that uh, docket. And I'll just post those uh, in the chat. Hopefully I am, I think I'm posting the correct link here. Uh, we conducted some modeling within that docket that shows a comparison of uh, a baseline system with different uh, dual fuel systems or an all electric system under these new proposed rate structures. And um, it's still uh, churning through um, their time of use rate was revised a little bit um, in their current proposal. So it's active. I, I won't share too much of the details there, uh, but the takeaways are that under the revised time of use rates, uh, a dual fuel or hybrid air source heat pump is uh, still competitive compared to a natural gas furnace. Um, an entry level variable speed unit offers the most savings relative to the base case. And at high gas costs, a cold climate air source heat pump is cost competitive if paired with the furnace. Um, and uh, the proposed space heat will result uh, excuse me, the proposed space heat rate will result in uh, significant savings compared to the non-space heat rate. So uh, stay tuned there. Um, more to come as that docket kind of uh, turns through. We're looking forward to seeing what they come up with. Robbie, could you talk a little bit more about uh, the some of the programs that you just mentioned with the Air Source Heat Pump Collaborative? Uh, sure. Yeah, so uh, we are... I mentioned the, and I'm sorry, Vivian, I've, um, yeah, I'm kind of jumping around a little bit here, but um, yeah, some of our programs are, uh, I mentioned our preferred contractor network and our statewide training. Um, I'm excited about uh, next spring. We've been operating these, um, uh, this training service for a few years now, and we're at the point where we've been honing in a little bit on what's needed. Uh, to uh, effectively train the market. So we're trying to conduct some gap analysis. We're going to be surveying contractors to find out what they're interested in learning. We have learned a little bit through exit surveys after the trainings have been conducted that they're really interested in uh, more information on sizing practices and airflow assessments and um, also switchover temperatures. And um, there's some guides available uh, that can help with that. Uh, for example, on Slipstream's uh, training website for ComEd, they have a, a switchover temperature guide that uh, can help. Um, I think Starstream for Energy Efficiency also has some, some contractor and customer guides that are, are really useful. And uh, yeah, we're trying to um, both uh, promote the resources that are already out there as well as uh, develop resources when needed. And uh, yeah, that more, more to come there, I would say. That's great, Robbie, to hear that there are so many resources available and that you guys are continuing to work on developing additional resources. I know that there's definitely a need for them. Um, so some states that we have looked at have energy efficiency goals um, and competing greenhouse gas reduction goals. I have a couple questions on, on this topic. Um, have you seen this at all in, in your work uh, first? Um, and then maybe second, 
have you do you have such suggestions for regulators uh, regarding how to navigate uh, this situation of competing GHG reduction goals and um, energy efficiency goals? Uh, for sure. Yeah, it's been uh, a quickly evolving landscape in Minnesota. Um, I, I moved back to Minnesota uh, growing up here uh, from Vermont in 2017. And um, yeah, since then, we've had a lot of different policies advance. Uh, first of all, we have a statewide all sector greenhouse gas goal uh, that is aiming to reach uh, net zero by 2050. Uh, and I'll just post that in the chat here. Um, we also have a carbon free standard for the electricity sector. So uh, that also has uh, an aggressive timeline aiming to get to uh, zero carbon electricity. Um, and then uh, real, the, the, uh, probably the best nexus with our work is the ECO Act, uh, which um, actually, unfortunately, don't think I have a, a link for, but the ECO Act uh, does allow fuel switching for utility rebate programs. So uh, excitingly, we're seeing uh, our largest investor-owned utility, Centerpoint Energy, um, a natural gas utility offering uh, heat pump rebates. And um, they're able to claim the uh, natural gas savings for switching to an electric air source heat pump uh, still operated in a dual fuel manner. Uh, and then the electric utility can claim those electric savings. So um, it's a pretty uh, unique program. And uh, we've also had some additional supportive mechanisms passed. For example, um, we have a residential heat pump rebate program that is intended to supplement the IRA programs. And, um, and then also, uh, lastly, I will mention that the societal cost test has been identified as the tool to use for um, the primary method to evaluate utility programs when utilities will promote their triennial plan. So what this does is it gives a value in the cost benefit test for uh, the price per ton for greenhouse gas reduction, as well as using the societal discount rate. So both of those levers can be a powerful tool to support things like electric vehicle rebates and then uh, also uh, heat pump rebates through fuel switching. Those are some interesting programs. I'm particularly interested in the societal cost test. That's that's really interesting. Um, so just, I know we only have a minute left, uh, but but to wrap up, do you have um, other specific policies, fuel switching or rate design uh, that you wanted to talk about just briefly as we wrap up our discussion uh, on, on, on this topic? Um, maybe I'll just uh, briefly say that um, really, if a standard rate is being used for a heat pump, the it's kind of a disservice potentially to that customer where uh, if it's if it's an additional load, for example, theoretically, if a heat pump is enrolled in a demand response program or if it's a dual fuel system, it could be providing beneficial load factor. So that that means that the heat pump will increase uh, utilization of existing utility investments, which then could in theory, justify or lower rate. So I think maybe the closing thing would be that uh, a heat pump meeting these criteria uh, could be mainly just adding variable costs and less so fixed costs uh, like t and upgrades or capacity investments. Uh, so it, it's helpful for regulators to consider a, an electric space heat rate or a dual fuel or off-peak rate uh, in their rate design uh, considerations. Fantastic, Robbie. Thank you so much. A lot of good information uh, and I know kind of a condensed timeline to talk through. I'm going to pass it back now to my colleague Rafi, who will be speaking with uh, Andrew. Uh, Vivian, and uh, thank you and welcome to Andrew McNeely uh, for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, I want to start up our conversation by uh, asking you to introduce yourself as, as well. I know you're from Maine. Uh, you worked for a time uh, at a, a rural utility up in the northern part of Maine, I believe, and now you're you're uh, with the Upper Peninsula Power Company, Upper Peninsula in Michigan. So can you tell us a little bit about your your experiences and, and what's it like working at uh, rural utilities specifically? 
So, Rafi, thank you very much, and thank Rap and in class for class for having me on the panel today. Um, so, yeah, you said that I I came from from Maine, and I did. I started in the electric utility industry in in 2005, but um, really started with heat pumps in 2010. When, as the, uh, my my job was a split split position between regulatory and energy efficiency. Um, in residential audits, and I got approached to work, be the business analyst for this new project or new idea that we had called heat pumps. And I said, what is that? So I, I jumped in and, and learned, and we started building out a pilot program. Um, and we had we had other state, other companies in New England, uh, Green Mountain Power in Vermont, um, that had done some stuff. But we in Maine, there had been nothing. So we actually started a heat pump pilot and filed it with our regulator, hoping to get 500 people to sign up. And after six months, we had over a thousand people already installed and more contractors, distributors joining us. So that's my background in introduction to heat pumps. But talking about small utilities, um, the utility I was with was the main public service and that it's been bought and sold a couple of times. Um, since then, but we had 39,000 customers and covered 4,400 square miles. Jump forward to 2016, I moved from Maine to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan for a job with um, Upper Peninsula Power Company. And guess what? We have now 54,000 customers and 4,400 square miles. Um, so in Maine, we had roughly 10 people per square mile. And in Michigan, we the area we serve, we have 12 to 13. So very rural areas. Um, sometimes it's a half mile or miles between houses. Um, so the, the struggle there with a rural utility is that you have a lot of infrastructure in the ground to get to the next house. Um, so the rates have always been a, a, an issue. Also, when you have rural rural utilities, you're always very cognizant of, okay, what happens if you have a severe blizzard or you have a windstorm or straight line winds of 65 miles an hour or with climate change, um, higher extreme heats and all that. So you, you have that a wider view um, and things sometimes seem to occur slower, but they always seem to occur back to back. Um, and I'll just give an example from Maine. We had a we had a, a terrible snowstorm on a Thanksgiving. We had a terrible snowstorm and blizzard on a Christmas. And then we were still restoring people on New Year's Day, all in the same year. And then the following year, we had um, a straight line wind event on the 4th of July. So every holiday in that one year period, people were out of power because of natural disasters and all of that. So um, you you very quickly adapt to that. So um, I hope that gives people a little bit of an introduction to who I am and where I come from. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, you're also, you're part of the, the Michigan Heat Pump Coalition as well as part of your work with, with UPCO. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so back in, and back in 2020, um, it, and it was probably the last conference I attended before the pandemic shut everything down. Is we were there were several several different utilities at the Midwest Energy Efficiency Alliance annual conference um, in that end of January, early February, and several of us had conversations with Slipstream staff, and we all had the same conversation, but at different times. And so when the pandemic hit, everything was, everyone was chaotic for a while, but we, the conversations came back and we started talking and we're like, oh, DTE has this same problem. Consumers has this problem. Indiana, Michigan has this problem. Upco has this problem. And as utilities, Slipstream actually put us together in a, in a manner and just said, why don't you talk, talk it through and find out what you can do so as the four utilities and uh, four, four investor-owned utilities in, in Michigan, we actually created, voluntarily created the, the Michigan Heat Pump Collaborative. And then 
as, as the four utilities, we jointly um, hired Slipstream to help manage it and help with the education. And what formed it was that we wanted a uniform education for contractors and customers across the state. And being different sized utilities, I, being a small utility, wanted to go fast and furious. I wanted to do more, do faster, get more education out there. Um, and also coming from Maine, where we had had that success with heat pumps very quickly early on. Um, and you'll, you'll, and Maine is still one of the leaders in heat pump um, adoption that way. I wanted to go faster, but at the same time, I needed to make sure the whole rest of the state um, was learning as well, because we very quickly found out, even though our service territories don't butt up against each other or overlap like DTE and consumers, we needed to have a, a similar voice. So um, I, I'll drop a link into the, the Michigan Heat Pump Collaborative, but we we actually work very closely with with Kellen and, and, the, and the Slipstream team for of providing the education, doing the webinars. We we focus on contractors. We've started to expand into um, doing more for the residential customer. So if a contractor goes and talks to a customer, they now have leave behind materials for that customer to learn more about um, heat pumps or after they've been installed, operation of the heat pump. Um, and, and I'll plug Upco for just a second. We just here in September, um, every Wednesday of the month in September, we released a new short video clip um, to, to, for customer education of heat pumps. Um, and uh, I'll drop that link in in the in the chat in just a moment as well, because it's brought people from what is a heat pump to it's actually being used here in the UP in a cold climate in working. Thank you. I, I want to drill down on this. I know we have a finite amount of time, but I'm, I'm a little curious because Helen mentioned earlier, you know, how important contractor education was. It was a big component of their needs assessment. You've just been talking about it now. You mentioned people are in different places. You want to move very quickly. Maybe some others are still trying to catch up. Uh, so my, my question is just, uh, are contractors, have they been generally receptive, interested, wanting to learn more? How much or how much are, are, are you trying to you know, push people along, let's say? So I will say that my, my experience in Maine with contractors and distributors is night and day compared to contractors and distributors here in, in the Upper Peninsula and in Michigan in general. So Maine had, Maine unfortunately or fortunately had a background of very large fuel oil being the primary heating source. So the cost effectiveness of a heat pump was was over the over the top. We had contractors lining up to participate in the program. There was one contractor that when he first came to the trainings that we offered in Maine said, I don't know anything about heat pumps. I'm just here to learn. Six weeks later, he had hired 16 guys to do installs of two heat pumps a day because it transformed his business. And now that company is one of the biggest um, heat pump installers in the state with multiple offices all over the state. Come to Michigan, I in eight years, I am still struggling to get contractors to understand the benefit. Even at the collaborative with DTE consumers in Indiana, Michigan, we have a few contractors that are working and do a very good work, but it, it doesn't seem to catch on fire like it did, and no pun intended. But um, that with in Maine, we had them after just weeks, a few weeks, they were they were all in. Here, the in Michigan at least, because of natural gas penetration, lower natural gas prices, um, and the history of heat pumps being brought up from down south and installed and told people told that they would work there's a bad taste in many people's mouths that it would never work so it has been a struggle um, i think our education and through the michigan heat pump collaborative we actually have a, a designation for contractors 
called the graduate designation that gives them gives the customer and gives the contractor a way to let them know that uh, they have the the understanding and the knowledge of the benefits of of heat pumps. And I just before we I jumped we jumped to the next question or whatever. I most of us have been talking about heat pumps as a heat a space heating and cooling source, but the Michigan Heat Pump Collaborative also focuses on heat pump water heaters, and UPCO um, is also expanding into discussions about heat pump clothes dryers and, in addition so that people are starting to understand that heat pump technology, it's been in your refrigerator for 50 years. Um, it just goes one way. Now it's going both ways and those opportunities are expanding. So. I just wanted to clarify that for everybody because it's not just heat pumps for space heating and cooling. Thank you. No, that's an important clarification. Um, and I know this is a very, very important topic to try to get people you know, on board and enthusiastic, not just kind of dragging their feet. Um, I do want to pivot a little bit uh, and, and wrap it up with, with one final uh, question uh, on, a, on a pretty, let's say, salient topic. Uh, Michigan, a couple months ago, was just awarded uh, quite a large pot of money uh, through the EPA's Climate Pollution Reduction Grant uh, for a number of activities kind of centered around um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But I know there's a considerable uh, piece of, of that uh, sum is allocated towards building electrification. Uh, it's going to be uh, administered through the Michigan's Department of uh, Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, and EGLE. Uh, so my, my question for you is, uh, how, do, how do you see uh, you know, that, that funding playing out? Is it going to affect your, the work that you do? And, and let's say, how, how might the state of Michigan kind of use those funds as a, a, a jumping off point? How can they supplement that with you know, additional policies or programs uh, to take the, the money even further? Yeah, no, that's a great question, Rafi. And there's actually other sources of funding that are coming in as well. Um, there's the, the greenhouse gas reduction funding that national coalitions were awarded at the federal level, which are look are are looking at the whole country, but some of them are looking at um or pieces of the coalitions are looking at Michigan. Um you also have the Inflation Reduction Act funding for home energy efficiency and for electrification. And then with the, the clean energy legislation that was passed last November in, in Michigan, the utilities are being, actually electric utilities have the option to voluntarily file for an electrification plan in addition to their energy waste reduction or energy efficiency plan. So there's a lot of pieces that can be stacked together or braided together, um, and then with the with so in Michigan you've got both the Inflation Reduction Act, which is being is handled by, as you said, the the Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, or Eagle. Um, they're also doing the greenhouse gas work, and they're focusing that their their efforts on the the Michigan uh, My Healthy Climate Plan. So I see that this will only push the opportunity for heat pumps and heat pump and beneficial electrification along faster. And um, because there are workforce development pieces of all of those grants or funding, um, the workforce will be built up fairly quickly. So I hope that addresses your question. There's probably a lot more that I could say, but in the amount of time, I, don't, I wanna make sure we have plenty of time for questions. Well, I appreciate that um, because uh, it is time to to pass it off to the Q&A. I could keep uh, talking with the three of you all afternoon, um, but unfortunately, we are constrained on time. So um, with this, I'm going to hand the mic over to Vivian again uh, to get us started with the Q&A. I know we've had a number of questions came in uh, from, from registrants before uh, we even started this webinar today. We've had a couple other questions come in during the webinar, um, I just want to remind you all uh, at the bottom of your screens, there is a Q&A question and answer tab. So uh, we're happy to field uh, as many questions as we are able. So um, type those in uh, if you've got questions to ask. And with that, um, Vivian, take it away. 
Thanks again, Rafi, and, and to our panelists. We've had some really interesting conversations so far. So we're going to dive right into the questions um, that we had uh, come in during the call so far. Um, so first we had one from Sarah. Um, I think that it was submitted during my conversation with Robbie, um, but I want to open this to any panelist to answer. Um, so the question was if you have encountered, uh, if anyone has encountered opposition to your programs, uh, Sarah is in a state or context that is heavily reliant on oil and natural gas uh, as main industries. Um, and they consider the rise of renewable energy sources a threat, uh, as many homes are heated by natural gas. Uh, so there are also no renewable portfolio standards and the utility rebate, rebate programs don't cover air source heat pumps. So, um, Robbie, do you want to kick us off with by taking Sarah's question? Sure. And uh, Andrew and Helen maybe have some things to supplement uh, with what I say. Uh, I think what's been very helpful for our approach is to be very pragmatic with our education and how we talk about air source heat pumps. And I mentioned our customer research findings around upfront and operational costs. And so I think a, a good strategy might be to, um, first of all, take into account that um, I think there's a, uh, there are multiple uh, peer-reviewed research studies that show no matter where you are in the country that a heat pump can still be um, the best option for a home uh, from a carbon perspective over the lifetime of the equipment. Uh, secondly, that um, a dual fuel heat pump might be a great way to um, kind of have a balance between uh, these competing interests. And this is what we're finding, especially in areas served by natural gas, it is the lowest cost option. And so the way we advertise our programs is that we're trying to replace ACs with heat pumps, uh, not necessarily to replace furnaces with heat pumps. And this is especially challenging uh, for programs that are aimed at uh, populations with lower income. Um, if, if it's an all electric approach without any weatherization, for example, it could increase bills. And so uh, I think all of those factors uh, will help uh, even in areas uh, where there might be these sentiments, this type of messaging has been very successful for us. We've received very positive feedback all throughout Minnesota. We're very similar to other areas of the country where there's a, a rural urban divide politically, and we've received a very consistent positive response from contractors across the state with this type of approach. Thanks, Robbie, for that great response. Andrew, did you want to contribute anything, or Kellen? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump. I'll jump in, and I, um, what I will say is, I, I, coming from Maine and in Michigan, I have two different perspectives. So, in Maine, the actually because it was fuel oil driven, and the fuel oil companies saw that with the the cost effectiveness of heat the heat pump systems, they actually started selling and promoting and training their technicians that used to only work on boilers and furnaces to install heat pumps. So in that, in that aspect, the, the fossil fuel industry or businesses saw that if they didn't do something, they would probably be out of business. So, um, or it, their business would be much diminished. So you, there was that, that switch or visual in, in, in Maine um, because of the cost effectiveness between fuel oil and a heat pump. Um, with, with natural gas and a heat pump, even with different rates, we UPCO offers an electric heating rate. So our cost per million BTUs is very close, if not the same as the cost for natural gas at today's prices. Um, so you have that mix, but it you're not going to see a, a, a changeover, especially um, as Sarah said, that she's from a state that is mostly um, fuel oil driven now. And I could probably guess which one of three or four states it might be. But um, yeah, the eco whole economy is based on a fuel oil based system. So you're going to have that opposition, but it's more going to be going to the weatherization, showing that you can make the house better, using it, as Robbie said, for replacing AC because the heat pumps are going to be more efficient 
and then using it to spread the, the fall and spring shoulder season heating and cooling needs because there's no need to turn on a furnace because it's 60 degrees in the morning and it's going to be 75 by lunchtime um, just to keep your 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 house warm where your your heat pump can do that very efficiently um, until there's a, a switchover point that may be a little bit lower. That sounds like the messaging is really key for, for how to approach opening minds to this. Um, Kellen, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I'll just add add briefly. I, I I'm laughing. I like that this question started. How has anyone encountered opposition? I think we could all say yes, and we've been creative with how we overcome those barriers, as you heard from from Andrew and Robbie, because it, it it is different depending on what what state you're in and what policy environment you're in and what are the barriers. What's the opposition you're actually trying to overcome? Um, the only thing I'll add that I don't think we've talked about yet is I think. Um, not that this is a huge driver at the moment, but consumer awareness is starting to grow. And so I think particularly even in states that uh, do not have a ton of market development activity, either that's being driven by states or utility programs, there's some consumer interest that's starting to, to drive a little bit of maybe, maybe that's going to push the states and or utilities to think about well, we were ignoring this or we didn't want to talk about this, but man, we're getting a lot of consumer interest or consumer questions. And I think there's going to be more and more of that with, with what's going on federally. Um, but as, as you can see, even hearing from Andrew in multiple states and Robbie, I think the, yes, we've probably all seen some opposition and, and how to overcome that opposition is, can be pretty uniquely tackled depending on where the opposition is coming from and what the barriers are. I, for one, find that really encouraging to hear. Kellen, thank you for sharing that about consumer interest. So we're going to keep moving along with questions because we've got a couple that have come in uh, and quite a few to get to uh, that came in with registrations. So um, so another question from uh, Jim for Andrew. Um, are your customers, customers excuse me, retaining some sort of supplemental heating source or moving exclusively to heat pumps? So... Um, I will say right now, almost all of our customers um, will have a supplemental heat source. Um, our first focus has been with heat pump conversion has been electric heating customers. So they're already using electric heat with, with heat pumps, they're using it more efficiently. Um, and many of the those customers leave some of their electric resistance in place as that backup for, for the heat pump um, if needed. Um, on the the fossil fuel side, uh, we're we're having more customers on, and especially with propane or fuel oil in the rural areas that are are either leaving their existing furnace or boiler in place, and knowing that it's only going to run maybe 150 to 200 hours during the year, because that's the time of that's the period of the year that the heat pump would be at its, I'll say the hardest to keep up with the, the temperatures if it's really cold, but with the changes in temperature, winter temperatures these last few years, um, even here in Marquette, the lowest temperature didn't even break zero degrees last year. So it's, um, and heat pumps are going down to minus five or minus 15. So it's 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 going to be changing um, as as the environment changes. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so I'll note we only have five minutes left. We'll try to get to one, maybe two more questions. Um, for anyone that is able to stay on, our panelists have generously offered to uh, continue answering questions for another half hour or so after the official uh, end time of the webinar. Um, in the meantime, we do have another question from Dan uh, asking if there are any demand response programs which heat pumps or batteries are eligible for um, in the region. I believe this came in during Andrew's uh, question, um, or sorry, uh, session, uh, but I would like to open this for all of our panelists to respond to if they would like to. Uh, I'd be happy to maybe go first. I um, I spoke kind of quickly and I've touched on a lot of different points, but we do have uh, demand response programs that support heat pumps in Minnesota uh, that are typically operated by uh, cooperatives. Um, they're 
There's a barrier though, this type of demand response is called direct load control. And so it's basically cutting a leg of power to the heat pump unit and variable speed products uh, get a little irritated. There will be a fault code that is issued by the system and many utilities that operate these types of programs are using a cycling program where it might be 15 minutes on and 15 minutes off. And if a fault code is issued, uh, it might have a delay of seven or eight minutes. And, uh, and then it will take a little bit while, uh, for this variable speed system, especially in the summer when we have our, our peak grid conditions where power is expensive uh, for that to catch up. And so that creates a problem. So many contractors are aware of this problem with variable speed systems and are um, avoiding um, hooking these up. So it might be more of uh, the lower um, lower tier heat pumps, like a single stage heat pump, for example, that would be um, have better eligibility for these uh, heat pump programs. And uh, regarding batteries, um, I, I don't know if I'm the best person to comment on it, but I did see an announcement from Carrier recently that um, not to favor any brand, but it was a unique uh, product category where they're thinking of embedding uh, about two hours of uh, standby power for a heat pump in their system uh, that might be launched in the coming years. So that might be a new product class that we see uh, in the future that could align well with these types of utility programs. Andrew or Kellen, would either of you like to add anything? I'm not sure I have much more for detail to add. Andrew, what about you? I, I don't. We don't offer a demand response program um, for our residential customers, so I, I wouldn't be familiar. Okay. Thank you both um, for that great response, Robbie, too. So uh, we do have another question from Alex. Um, there has been discussion of contractor education. I think uh, several of our panelists brought this up. Uh, it would seem that manufacturers and distributors have a financial incentive to promote heat pumps uh, due to a higher price point. Uh, what, if any, outreach and education are manufacturers and distributors doing with contractors? I think this is a really good question um, that several of you could answer. Uh, does anybody want to start us off? I'll, I'll start us off quick. I know that we're right at time and, and that, but the contractors and distributors are part of or co what we call friends of the collaborative for the Michigan Heat Pump Collaborative. And they're doing their own outreach, their own marketing through their distributor channels and contractors. Um, and that only benefits the utilities, the customers, and the other programs that are providing funding. I'll just I'll just add, I think a lot of manufacturers and distributors are are doing a lot around education. And especially the folks who have the products out there, they're doing that very spot product specific training uh, for the contractors that that they're working with. Um, I think in all of our all of our efforts, Michigan, Midwest at broad and and the work that Robbie's doing in Minnesota, uh, we try to stay really aligned with what the manufacturers and distributors are doing. They have incredible market insights. Um, they have the contractor connections. They obviously have the equipment as well. So, um, yeah, I think alignment with with those folks are are really important for the contractor education piece. I think we are right at time. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, those anyone who can stay on, our panelists have some other questions uh, that came in with registrations. Um, but uh, we understand if you have other commitments and need to, to drop off. So thank you to all who have been able to join us for this excellent call with our uh, wonderful panelists today. Um, <clears throat> so we have another question that came in. Uh, and I want to direct this one to Kellen first. Um, can you comment on policy needs for other Midwestern states, um, including Indiana and Ohio, et cetera? Sure. I And I will definitely point you towards that uh, regional dashboard that I think I, li I linked earlier in the chat. But um, what it really comes down to, in my mind, when it comes to favorable policy in the state um, for supporting heat pump adoption. Um, 
and it's things we've ar- we've already touched on and i think that is fuel switching is a big one i'll 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 focus on that for a second i think um the ability for en- utility energy efficiencies to take advantage of fuel switching when it comes to um you know allowing that for their savings that has the ability to really spur a lot of momentum toward or i guess away from uh from heat pump technology um we've talked a lot about minnesota and michigan obviously with robbie and andrew on on the call and and those states really are some leaders when it comes to heat pump adoption um a, a state like illinois has some favorable policy toward towards fuel switching um but in states where that's not allowed or there's no specific policy which is honestly much of the midwest um, I think that's really a a, a a distinct policy that that comes to mind for me as having a lot of power to spur on more momentum towards heat pumps. Thanks, Kellen. I just want to give all of our panelists an opportunity um, to share advice uh, for utility regulators trying to understand and get the most for their states um, out of this transition as kind of a final wrap up. So uh, for each of you to share share your thoughts. Andrew, would you like to start? I'll be glad to start. Um, I, I, th- there's a lot going on in Michigan, um, being a regulated utility and on both energy efficiency and electrification. I think that there's a huge opportunity for the regulator to interpret the statute. Um, and, I, and I'll say differently than they have historically, because the statute, have, the wording hasn't really changed since 2008. But when it says energy savings, being able to consider the beneficial electrification and the energy efficiency reduction is critical to that interpretation. Um, As Kellen just mentioned, it allows that fuel switching to be included and and captured um, where the clean energy legislation that was passed goes a a step in that direction, but then it, it opens the door and then slams it in your face by saying, Oh, sorry, you can't count any of these savings towards any of your programs. So um, I think that that interpretation, which there are open cases and discussion on in Michigan, at least, would be beneficial for policy going forward. I can I can go next in. Probably unsurprisingly, since I'm coming at this from a bit of a higher level Midwest um, standpoint, is I think um, for utility regulators that are trying to, you know, assist in their state's transition, first and foremost, I think understanding the unique needs for for what's going on in your state is going to be most important, Um, because as we've all kind of mentioned, um, some states have really favorable policy, some don't. Some have individual state collaboratives that are already pouring out resources and education, some do not. Um, and some have just favorable market conditions. Maybe you're in a milder climate, maybe um, the the um, the rates in your state are favorable for helping switch to heat pumps. Um, so you're going to have some some different unique opportunities and, and barriers depending on what state you're in. Um, I think I'll I'll go back to what the Midwest Air Source Heat Pump Collaborative is really focused on, which is cross pollinating program best practices. So I would really encourage um, folks to talk to each other within your state and across states that are in a similar footprint and learn about what efforts are already happening. We don't need to all reinvent the wheel. Um, Slipstream, uh, UPCO, CE, we work to, we talk a lot. We work together on a lot of similar things, sometimes directly and sometimes just to bounce ideas off each other, to learn from what each other are doing. Um, and so maybe that's not a distinct um action item for you to you know it's it's not super concrete because it requires some work on on your end to figure out uh you know what is going on in your own state what those barriers are um and then talk to other folks who are trying to do the same thing and and see what resources are are already out there um yeah i think 
Andrew and Kellen really summarize things well, so I actually don't have a, a ton of extra content to layer on top of that, but maybe just to add a little bit of uh, a flair, pepper, or spice, I guess, on those key concepts that I, I really agree with that, um, yeah, certain things like uh, rate structures and the cost to serve customers uh, and how that can be um, a really key supportive technology or supportive method for uh, heat pump technology is, is a great consideration for regulators. And then um, also um, a program uh, may or may not be cost effective depending on the test that is used. So uh, considering something like a societal cost test or uh, a unique cost test, Minnesota, um, I, I may have misspoke earlier, actually, Minnesota has its own, what they call the Minnesota cost test, which is a variant of the societal cost test that is used uh, to evaluate programs. And uh, I think both of those things can act in tandem, uh, but uh, a regulatory process uh, may only be as good as uh, the legislative framework also that enables a uh, different type of uh, aspect to uh, move forward. Uh, for example, with fuel switching uh, in Minnesota, that wouldn't be possible without the ECO Act, which uh, reformed the Next Generation Act in 2007. So uh, I, I think it's kind of a twofold thing where it needs to be good regulatory policy as well as um, good legislation and statute to build from. Well, thank you. This has been a, a terrific discussion, everyone. You know, we wanted to emphasize collaboratives today because in this informal structure, people are, are able to learn from each other as Kellen just pointed out, from each other's work, from each other's solutions, really important. We wanted you to understand the value and technical support that comes along with collaboratives and how this has helped increase understanding of uh, heat pump technology um, and the economic and regulatory challenges and solutions that are, uh, that are part of this discussion. We thirdly also wanted to illustrate how states up on the Canadian border with the weather you might expect um, are developing solutions to heat pump adoption. Anyway, on behalf of, of Kellen and Robbie and Andrew and Vivian and Rafi and uh, Donna Brutkowski, who has been our comms support here for this webinar, I want to thank you all for joining us. Um, as is the case I mentioned earlier on, we have a few more questions. If you all want to stick around, we're happy to uh, continue answering questions for another 15 or 20 minutes. So I'm going to hand it back to Vivian. Thanks, Dave, and apologies for putting us a little over time, getting carried away with some of the excellent questions we have in the, the question and answer session chat here. So um, I kind of want to take Ray's question next, uh, asking what is the latest recommendation for managing thermostats for heat pumps? Um, do uh, any I'll, be, I'll be glad to jump in, and I know Robbie and Kellen will, will, will have additional support. So. Um, my my when I talk to a customer that's installing a heat pump or has a heat pump, I the phrase I use is set it and forget it. Set it for the temperature that you want it to be, because a heat pump is a slow source of moving heat from outside to inside. Um, so in the winter time, make sure it's in the heating mode and put it at the temperature that you want it, and it will keep that space very narrow as a very narrow band around that temperature. And in the summer, make sure it's in cooling mode, and 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 again set the temperature, and it'll keep it very, very close to that temperature set. Using auto mode, people think it's easier, but it end, ends up I find being more uh, a more higher use of the energy of the system. So, if you can make sure it's in heating mode or cooling mode, and as I said, set it and forget it, and um, and go from there. You don't want to get go back to the the furnace or system where it's like nighttime setbacks and 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 that because then the system isn't going to be efficient. Robbie or uh yeah maybe uh this is perhaps controversial. I um I was at, at ACEEE summer study uh, and there were some folks that presented a alternative idea. So I'm kind of playing the contrarian, Andrew, um, where uh, I think many, many customers feel comfortable with a lower temperature overnight. And 
Um, and so what some of the attendees at the uh, conference were suggesting is that maybe this could be a challenge for manufacturers to develop algorithms in their controls procedures to allow for a setback, but then to try to mitigate uh, the uh, firing of supplemental heat. So I think that's the problem, as, as Andrew was illustrating with um, not setting it and forgetting it, is that if it's a deep setback when it's trying to recover, a heat pump is heating the home over a long period of time, so it works best if it's just staying constant, but if it's trying to recover, it's going to fire on that supplemental heat or electric resistance, which will increase costs or use uh, more energy or uh, produce more carbon emissions. And so there could be uh, a strategy maybe in, in the controls that could uh, mitigate that through a slower recovery period. Um, we, we do kind of say, set it and forget it or set it back to a minimal degree, maybe two degrees to try to avoid uh, uh, that problem. Cause yeah, it will, uh, it'll lead to unintended consequences. People might be surprised by their bill, for example, if, if they don't operate it that way. And I think the Consortium for Energy Efficiency um, has a customer controls guide that uh, goes over some of these concepts. It's really useful. We're going to be uh, publishing some of those on our website soon. And uh, I don't have that link handy, but if you go to the Consortium for Energy Efficiency or, or search that with a uh, customer controls guide, you might be able to find that. Nothing more to add for me, unless we really want to go down the rabbit hole of of temperature and and thermostat setting, but I don't think we want to do that. <laughs> they they hit the they hit the the high level points. Yeah, thanks, Andrew and Robbie. Um, Rafi, do you want to pick up some of the other questions we've we've had come in? Absolutely. Uh, I don't want to don't want to saddle you with all of the Q and A. Um, we have a a few questions uh, to get through that that came in uh, from people when they were registering. Um, I'll, I'll start off. There's there's one kind of general question for uh, any of the three of you who's uh, you know has has an opinion on this. It's how do you make this this technology heat pumps uh, more attractive in a state that's founded on and still heavily uh, you know shaped or reliant on the fossil fuel industry? And I'll I'll pair that with another kind of question we had farther down. Should heat pumps get a, a new name or a rebrand? How do we how do we make this? more attractive are, are there are there things any of you are working on we've done a lot with contractor education right public education what are we seeing that's working here uh, i'll jump in here rafi just quickly we we touched on this a little bit earlier when we uh, when we answered uh one of the panelists or the, the viewers questions i think it was sarah um so the the way to look at it and is to understand who the market is or who the customer is. Um, from my, as I said, from my experience in Maine, the customer was focused very much on the save energy savings, and even the the oil dis distribution companies jumped on and understood that their customers are going to switch and leave them behind because of the savings or that. Um, here in Michigan. I focus on the ability to, because we did a market characterization study for our utility back in 2020 and 2021, that found that the majority of our customers have never had a air conditioning, but now the extreme heat events, it's hitting very quickly, high temperatures, high humidity. So they're looking for some type of dehumidification and air conditioning solution. So, being able to tailor heat pumps to offering that cooling dehumidification and shoulder season heating because they, they still have a heating system that they, is tried and true to them so picking it up one piece at a time so i think the marketing of it is focusing on what the customer needs um, and the second part of your question is what do we call heat pumps well um it, that's a funny that's a that's a good one because heat pumps do both heating and cooling um there are people that call it a comfort solution or a, a year-round comfort system uh there there's others that just say 
it's it's my my back it's my go to system. So I would say something along the lines of a comfort comfort system because it is year round um, and heating and cooling. But I know Robbie and Kellen probably have many have heard many other ideas and, and comments. Well, I think CEE, maybe you all did a study on that recently, or I feel like I heard something from someone else at CEE about, you know, the name, the name of heat pumps. Do we need to go through a rebrand like Dunkin' Donuts? We're just Dunkin' now. Um, so I'll, uh, maybe I'll let you tackle that, but just going back to how to make this technology attractive, I totally agree with Andrew. And I think the other thing, it just, it, a lot of times it comes down to dollars. You know, how do you make something attractive, make it attractive financially? Um, and that is like both for the homeowner, that's for the utility, that's for the manufacturers and distributors. How can we make it financially attractive? Are there incentive programs? Are there midstream programs that are giving the rebates to those middle actors? Are there incentives for the customer? Um, you know, are, what are the, the target audiences for heat pump technology? Because you also want to make sure it makes sense financially to the homeowner. You don't want their bill to go up. Um, that's probably the most important thing. So, um, yeah, that's the first thing that comes to mind. How do you make anything attractive? Make it attractive financially. Then people will get interested. Yeah, I agree with that completely, Kellen. I'm not sure exactly what uh, research you were pointing to, so it might be a follow-up item. Uh, but I think I agree. I'll, that I'll look into it. I hope <laughs> I'm not making something up. <laughs> I, I agree that we could probably call it whatever we want. Uh, we could. Uh, it could be a made-up word, and if it has a good value proposition, people are going to be interested in it. And uh, a heat pump. Um, it does describe what the unit is doing. It's pumping heat either inside or out of the home. And so if, if we can improve the customer education and awareness, uh, as well as the value proposition with the, the cost aspects, uh, I think that people are going to be taking notice and uh, pay attention. Uh, it's a pretty big shift turn to try to rename a, a product class uh, entirely. I think it'd take a, a pretty concerted effort. It's kind of like the maybe the um, imperial versus uh, metric unit system. That's, I think a lot of people agree that it's, uh, well, maybe not, but uh, yeah, that maybe one way or the other would be easier, but uh, it's just a big shift to course correct on. Thank you all. And for whatever it's worth, uh, I think heat pump is a perfectly fine name. So um, I, I, we're, we're uh, running a little bit uh, towards the end. So I wanna combine a couple of questions here. Maybe this will be um, our final one. We spoke a little bit, or Andrew and I spoke a little bit about leveraging federal funding. And that's what this, this next couple of questions gonna to try to combine them on uh, are, are, are. So I wanna to, want to make sure we end kind of talking about, talking about that, because that's something that uh, RAP talks about quite a bit. I know it's relevant in every state, but there's a lot of federal money out there. So. The first question is, uh, what are the prerequisites, if any, that states must meet in order to qualify or potentially qualify for federal funding? And I'll combine that with a kind of more general, what advice can be shared with others around the country when it comes to leveraging federal funding? So how could the state qualify and how could you, how would you recommend, you know, leveraging that, that funding, uh, amplifying it, supplementing it, you know, with local or state programs? Um, you know, it was just as a kind of a final thought to wrap things up. And we can go down the we can go down the list here. We'll just take it from the the order we spoke to you in. So, um, Kellen, you're first up. Sure. Um, well, I don't think anyone wants me to go into the details of all of the steps that states have to take in order to apply for and receive the federal funding. But those are lined. Those are outlined by. Um, you, you know, the, the different federal sources, there's a lot of federal funding out there right now. Um, but for much of it, the states, you know, are allocated certain tranches of money. So it's there as long as the states are submitting their applications and hitting the various deadlines and meeting, you know, the application requirements that are that are put out there by the Department of Energy and, and by the other federal agencies. Um, the money is there and um, states can apply for it. 
And so, as some states, I'm sure folks know, have already received some of that funding. They've started some of their home energy rebate programs and in some of the other federal funding programs as well. Um, so that's that's all I'll say there. There's a lot more details that folks can probably look into. Um, and your next, your second part was how to how to leverage that federal funding and kind of coordinate it with all the other utility and state funding. Was that the second part of this? Yeah, um, it was just kind of what you know. What advice would you share when it comes to leveraging you know, different sources of funding? Yeah. Uh, probably the theme of everything I've said has been really around collaboration, and I'll just continue to say say that because there is so much going on right now um, in terms of federal funding, in terms of what different states are doing, um, and it doesn't need to happen in in you know this black box where you're not talking to anyone outside of that. Um, I think where we're seeing states have the most success so far with. Um, both their federal funding and coordinating it with utility programs and other state offerings is where they're collaborating the most, um, where they're talking to the different entities. The utilities are talking to the state energy offices and vice versa, and maybe they're bringing in uh, third-party implementers or statewide initiatives for um, training or for um, you know incentives management, all, all of that. Um, I think that's where states are seeing the most success is just opening up those communication channels. It's a lot, I think we can acknowledge. It's a lot that's going on federally right now. And then utilities have all their other um, very important goals that, that that many utilities are held to. So um, I know folks don't just have hours and hours of available time to go and do all this research and have these conversations with other entities. Um, but I think overall, It'll make everyone's lives a little bit easier to to coordinate. So we can have coordinated programs between utilities and federal funds, so that customers have really um, specific, direct, and and clear messaging on, oh, I am getting this util this utility incentive for this piece of equipment, and they've then pointed me, or in some way, there's a state website or something that I can go to that I know clearly I can also get this tax credit for this and this federal, re I can do all of these things in one place, um, or at least in a way that doesn't take the, the general consumer hours and hours and hours of research to figure out what to do. So I'll stick with the theme of let's collaborate more, let's talk more, let's bring the entities together to try to have clear and consistent messaging and programs um, across the board. Appreciate that, that message, collaboration. Um, Robbie, uh, what are your thoughts? I don't know if this is the, the correct subject for me to weigh in on too heavily. I think Kellen uh, gave a really uh, succinct and helpful answer. I, maybe my, my one ax to grind or um, topic that I would just pepper in related to the collaboration point that uh, was made is that uh, we do recognize and understand that different heat pump specifications can create a barrier for adoption. And so that's where collaboration is really key. So um, yeah, knowing what those uh, specification levels are and, and how those programs would uh, braid or stack together uh, is really key uh, to be able to, to launch. I, I think Rewiring America has a great tool uh, where folks can um, enter in to find rebates. I think, um, yeah, knowing, knowing different product class levels and things like that. That's where contractor education on incentives is also really important once these programs do roll out. Um, and then, yeah, making sure to get it right on the front end as, as Kellen has mentioned. Appreciate you, you weighing in as you're able. Um, and, and Andrew, I know we, we spoke a little bit about federal money already, but any any final thoughts? Yeah, so I'm going to really more touch on the, the second piece of your question, which is the advice um, and I, this is, this is more from personal experience um, with IRA funding here in Michigan and, and some of the discussions we've had about that rollout is you have federal, state, and local funding and local and could include utility funding to help be stacked together. Um, the one piece of advice that I would give is that when you have local funding or state funding, you have to look up the chain of where it came from 
because um, here in Michigan, we have our weatherization program, which is funded through the federal government, which those dollars cannot be combined with the Inflation Reduction Act, which is also doing weatherization, heat pumps, and all of that because of the 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 upstream source of those dollars. So just my my suggestion there is or advice is just look at where the original source of the dollars came from if it's at a state or local program because it may or may not be able to be used and blended together. Um, one of the things that I have I've learned from various conferences this past year is that any of the dollars that were went to the USDA from the Inflation Reduction Act actually can be blended, braided, or stacked with other DOE dollars that came out of the Inflation Reduction Act, but DOE dollars can't be used to go to a USDA program. So you just have to make sure the direction and the source of the dollars and, and that. So that's my one piece of advice with the with the federal, state, and local dollars. Well, thank you all. We are uh, coming right up at, at 3.30. Um, thanks to everybody who's stuck around with us for 90 minutes of what I thought was a really interesting discussion. Um, thank you to Kellen, Robbie, and Andrew for taking the time uh, to lend your expertise to us today. And uh, thank you to my, my colleagues at RAP and CLASP, Dave, Vivian, and Donna, behind the scenes for helping me put this uh, great webinar, great discussion on today. Um, so with that, I don't know, Dave, if you have any other final thoughts, but I, I think uh, once again, thank you to everybody who participated, who viewed, um, and uh, we will see you next time.